Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am speaking with Jonathan Lassos. Jonathan is an evolutionary ecologist who studies rapid evolution, behavior, ecology, and phylogenetics. He has degrees from Harvard and currently teaches at the Washington University in St. Louis. He is also the founding director of the Living Earth Collaborative, which is a partnership between Washington University, St. Louis Zoo, and the Missouri Botanical Gardens. He's been the recipient of many awards, including the E.O. Wilson Naturalist Award, and he is the author of the book, Improbable Destinies, Fate, Chance, and the Future of Evolution. And uh, that's what we talk about in this conversation. We talk about uh, what is convergent evolution. Um, as I say in the conversation, uh, this is probably the best book I have read, uh, the best popular science book, I should say, I've read on convergent evolution. Uh, doesn't get talked about as much, and it's just fantastic. And so the first part of the book, he really goes through discussing an outline, convergent evolution. We talk about the role of the environment for convergent evolution. We talk about um, behaviors and phenotypes and how that has an important role for understanding convergent evolution. We talk about speciation and adaptive radiation. We talk about how evolution can work fast. Um, he pulls a lot of examples from his work um, with different types of lizards on different types of islands. We talk about the LTEE and E. coli, and then we talk about the future of evolution and life on other planets. Jonathan was an absolutely fantastic uh, person to talk about uh, convergent evolution and all of the particulars. His book is absolutely wonderful. And he's, he's just doing fabulous work. And so I was really, really excited to talk about this aspect of evolution on, on the podcast. I've obviously talked about different components of evolution, uh, different points. And so I think this is a really uh, wonderful addition to um, those types of discussions. And so now I bring you Jonathan Lassos. I'm here with Jonathan Lassos. Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, greatly looking forward to, to talking with you about your book and, uh, and your research. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, of course. Uh, kind of give us your, uh, you know, kind of very brief kind of biography of sorts. Uh, tell us uh, who you are, your background, what you currently do in research, um, and all the, all the wonderful particulars. Sure. Well... I'm a professor at Washington University in St. Louis, a professor of biology. Um, my story is a pretty straight, straight path. When I was five years old, I was crazy about dinosaurs. And I was one of those kids who knew every, the name of everyone, all the facts and so on. I carried a basket full of plastic dinosaurs to nursery school and so on. As I got older, I transitioned from, from dead reptiles to living ones. And Somehow my mother allowed me to have little baby alligators as pets, actually caimans, a South American, Central American relative of the alligator, and, uh, and lizards as well. And as I grew up, I just was fascinated with reptiles. I went to college and decided I would major in biology to see if that interest grew. And the more I learned, the more fascinated I became. And so I became a scientist and I study the diversity of reptiles, how, how that evolves, how particular species adapt to the environment they live in, and, uh, and how species interact with their, their ecosystems. And so I've been studying lizards professionally for you know, 35 years or so now. Hmm. Uh, and so, I, I'm, uh, so that's what I do for research. I continue to study lizards. I also run a biodiversity center here at Washington University that works with the St. Louis Zoo and the Missouri Botanical Garden to work together to address problem issues in biodiversity. Oh, nice. That's very, very nice. Yes. And, and the, you know, you have the coolest job, right? It's the coolest job in the world. It has and, its moment. And, uh, and you've written a fantastic book. I mean, just really fantastic. I, I've read it a few times now. And it's just when I first read it, I mean, it just kind of really hit me. Um, it's called Improbable Destinies, Fate, Chance, and the Future of Evolution. And the thing that makes it spectacular is many people will talk about uh, 
uh, convergent and divergent evolution. Um, and, but you, I mean, you really have written in terms of the popular science, uh, world in terms of books, kind of, you know, the, especially the first part of the book is on convergent evolution, which was super, super, super wonderful to read and, and to see and to show its importance. And so, um, I, I absolutely love the book. It's great. Well, thank you for all those kind words. You're making my head swell. <laughs> no, no, really. I, I, I really like to see people um, create and put things out into the world, uh, and especially in a way that people can understand and, and, and help us understand more about the natural world. And so, you, you know, your contribution there is, is really invaluable. So it's, it's wonderful. Well, thanks. It was a lot of fun to write. <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's start with that. Let's start with convergent evolution. Um, most people will know, I mean, I've had handful of people on the podcast we've talked about evolution for hours and it's it's one of my favorite topics uh but convergent evolution is not something that gets talked about as much and, and many people when i've asked will say uh oh, it's you know i'm not a specialist there i don't know as much about it or whatever and so uh, we've talked about evolution in general i've talked about natural and sexual selection etc but tell us what is convergent evolution how do we define it and and some of the uh the specifics well, at its heart, the idea of convergent evolution is a pretty simple one. It's the idea that two species independently evolve to be similar. They converge. And so just an example I think everyone can appreciate, if you've ever looked at a dolphin and a shark, you say, well, these things look really very similar. And it's very easy to mistake one for another in the water. Um, but they're not at all closely related. Sharks are a type of fish. Dolphins are a type of mammal. And so they have independently evolved to have that very similar body shape. And so that, that's convergent evolution. And uh, it often occurs, there are other ways it can occur, but it often occurs when species adapt to the same environmental situation, that uh, the, the best solution might be a particular body shape or a particular physiology. And so species independently evolve that same solution to a problem posed by the environment. And so that, that's what convergent evolution is. And it's, as I said, very often uh, evidence of adaptation. Mm. Now, the interesting thing about convergent evolution is that we've known about it for a very long time. In fact, if you go back to read On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, he mentions convergent evolution. He doesn't use that term, but he clearly talks about the phenomenon. And it's long been recognized to be very strong evidence for the operation of natural selection, that natural selection sculpts a species to adapt to its environment. And when species live in same, same environments, natural selection leads to the same, to the same result, the same solution. So people have long said, well, convergent evolution, that just shows how powerful natural selection is. But by the same token for surely more than a century after Darwin, people considered convergent evolution to be pretty rare. That's a, you know, every time a new example would come up, it would be touted as, oh, this amazing example. Can you believe this happened? Uh, this rare evidence for natural selection. Uh, but recently we've come to realize that far from being rare, convergent evolution is quite common, that there are many examples throughout the animal and plant kingdoms and in microbes of such convergence occurring. And in fact, in the last few years, a number of scientists have written very large books that are just one example after another, trying to make the case that convergent evolution is a very common phenomenon. Yeah, it, it's interesting, right? Because even though it's so common, I feel like it, it gets less, I mean, obviously, I'm sure in, in biology, it gets, it's, gets discussed, but it gets, you know, less in, in, in popular science um, discussed as, as much as maybe it should. Um, and, and so the, the key factor here is, that the environment is kind of the thing that's pulling for for some of these ways in which spe different species will adapt similar ways of of interacting with that environment. So, I guess what are the key uh, features or elements of of the environment for convergent evolution? Right? How do what is it about the environment that can can sometimes lead to different species evolving kind of similar kind of features? Well, one way that, that the environment can promote convergent evolution is situations in which there is a optimal solution to the problem posed by the environment. Now, some scientists don't like talking about optimal and, and solutions and so on, but as a, just as a way of expressing it, I think it gets the idea across. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to that example of sharks and dolphins. Uh, 
both of those types of animals are predators that rely on speed to outswim their prey and catch them. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that when you're talking about uh, swimming through a dense medium like water, we can look to physics. There is a best shape that, uh, that to move quickly through water, and that's a streamlined body shape. That's why submarines are basically that same shape as well. And so in this case, there is a best solution and natural selection repeatedly favors organisms, uh, individuals that have that, that solution. And so that's how it evolves. And in fact, a streamlined body form has evolved independently in many different fast marine predators, tuna, for example, or a prehistoric reptile called the ichthyosaurs that lived in the age of dinosaurs. It looked just like sharks. Um, and actually, they look more like dolphins. Um, so another example, well, to give you another example, um, if we look at flight. Mm -hmm. It turns out there has been a lot of work mm -hmm. on the physics of flight when you're building airplanes and so on. Yeah. And there's a reason that uh, jet airliners, for example, have long, thin wings and fighter jets have short, stubby wings because those different types of planes have different uh, jobs. And one is to fly, jetliners want to fly efficiently. You use as little fuel as possible. Air, uh, jet fighters want to be very fast and maneuverable. And so they have different wing shapes. Mm -hmm. Well, when you look at types of birds, they've done the same thing that depending yeah. albatrosses have have wings like jetliners and uh, hawks have have wings like uh, jet fighters. So it, the point is that there are in many cases, the, the, the environment poses problems that there are best solutions that for uh, the structures that evolve in animals and often or plants too, and often those structures evolve repeatedly. Mm, yeah, well, th that's that's a curious thing, right? Because obviously, there's been many uh, extinctions on the planet, right? You know, there's been at least five or six, whatever there are. Yeah. <clears throat> and life repeats itself, right? So kind of this this idea of now, obviously, over, you know, 4 billion years, the planet has evolved and changed in different ways in terms of the climate and, and in terms of um, different types of terrain that has been had, you know, very extreme temperatures of heat and cold at different periods in different ages. But it, there's this element of life repeating itself. And, and how much of the determinism, I guess you could say, uh, I know that makes some people, you know, queasy, but how much of the determinism within natural selection is there, right? How much is it that if there's an environment that is a particular way with a particular set of variables, there's some optimal ways of trying to say, here's what is a, a best solution, or here are some solutions for how to thrive and survive in this environment. What, what can we say about the, I guess, quasi or deterministic elements of, of, uh, of uh, evolution? Well, that is a great question. And to some extent, that is the driving question of my book. Um, and you know, how deterministic is evolution? How much do we get the same outcome time and time again? And the, the answer I'm going to give you is a little bit unsatisfactory, um, but what it comes down to is this, that it's deterministic. Sometimes we get a lot of this convergent evolution, a lot more than we used to think occurred. But on the other hand, it's not always deterministic. There are many other examples in which species living in what seems to be the same environment don't evolve the same adaptations. Mm. And so you don't have... Uh, you don't have convergent copies, what I, what I call uh, doppelgangers, the German word, for example. That often doesn't happen. And in fact, the opposite, I would say, of a, of a doppelganger is something that has been called an evolutionary singleton, something that occurs only a single time and doesn't have any match anywhere else. And for example, an elephant. Elephants only evolved once, something like elephants. And you might think, well, there's this niche that elephants live in today, and surely there have been other animals living in that niche over the millions of years of evolution. How come something like an elephant hasn't evolved more than one time? Um, or my favorite animal of all time, the duck-billed platypus, a, mm -hmm. a spectacular animal, mm -hmm. lives in streams in Australia. Well, there are streams similar to where the platypus lives on just about every continent, and yet there is no other platypuses. So unfortunately, uh, the answer that I can give you is, unsatisfying. <laughs> yes, we do have this convergence, this deterministic outcome occurring many times, but many other times it doesn't occur. And so the, the question that, um, well, I told you there are all these books listing example after example of convergent evolution. Well, they're very impressive. Mm 
but mm -hmm. one could write equally full books of examples of non-convergence, of forms that, mm. that have evolved and have no parallels. And for a while, that's what this debate uh, seemed to be, is, is list of this or that. <laughs> I think we have to recognize now that both occur, and the real question is trying to understand why. Mm. Why in some cases convergence occurs, whereas in other cases it doesn't. Yeah, that's. I think that's actually. You know, it it may seem unsatisfactory in some ways, right? Because we like the very definitive. You know, you know, wrap it all up. Here's the answer. But I actually think that that answer is satisfactory because it says that there's a lot of variance within many living organisms on the planet, and in some cases it's going to be this way. In other cases, it's not. That can be hard to kind of make predictions of things. But I think it's important to see all the the varieties of of of, uh, of life. So there's these there's these two categories. Right of of yeah, marsupials uh, and placentals, yes. Yes, although I have to, I, I yes, do to, it, do it. Go ahead. To an asterisk. Um, initially, a long time ago, there were no placental mammals, but in the relatively recent millions of years past, there have been some rodents and bats that have gotten to Australia. Hmm. And so, although we think of Australia as full of marsupials, and it is, mm -hmm. there are a fair number of placental mammals younger evolutionarily in the rodent and bat families is is that because of just kind of drift or is that because of because they've come from other other uh coming parts from of the other globe? places they've mm -hmm. mostly mm -hmm. come from asia and coming down through indonesia and so on bats of course can fly and some mm -hmm. rodents are good at, at hanging onto wood and drifting across oceans and so mm -hmm. there have been a few uh a, a few colonizations of those but your bigger point is absolutely correct when we think of australia it is full of marsupials Whereas marsupials don't occur very commonly in most of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and the bigger animals there are, in, are marsupials, whereas in the bigger animals in the rest of the world are placentals. Mm -hmm. But placentals are mammals that have a placenta throughout mm -hmm. the em embryological development like we do. And so I guess just tell us about that kind of those two, I guess, subdivisions of that. You know, how, how does that happen where majority of... Uh, uh, the animals on uh, the continent of Australia are marsupials and and not so much in the rest of the world and vice versa with placentals. Is is that a clear picture in some of these categories of certain animals that will be, you know, again, convergent, right? Well, you'll see two different types or subtypes of animals that, you know, evolve differently or how do we understand these, uh, these kind of subcategories? Well, it, it, this has to go back to the geological history of Australia, that Australia broke off of the supercontinent of Gondwana, I can't remember, 80 million-ish mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, there were no placental mammals on Australia for reasons we don't entirely understand. Mm -hmm. And marsupials apparently walked over to Australia by way of Antarctica. That at one time, South America, where marsupials were, uh, Antarctica and Australia were all connected geologically. And so the marsupials walked into Australia and the continents then completely split off. And then for many millions of years, the marsupials evolved by themselves in Australia, whereas in the rest of the world, the placental mammals were also evolving. And so uh, Australia was its own evolutionary theater in a way. And so they diversified greatly. And when you look at the marsupials that are around today in Australia, or were until recently, sadly, some have gone extinct, mm -hmm. you find a number of types that look very similar to forms that have evolved elsewhere in the world. And so, for example, there's an animal called the thylacine or marsupial wolf. Mm -hmm. And that's a, an animal that if I showed you a picture or a video of one, you would say, what a cool looking dog. I want one of that breed. <laughs> right. Yeah. But they're not dogs. They're not wolves. They are marsupials. They have a pouch like kangaroos. Mm -hmm. And if you look very carefully, you can see some differences to dogs. But overall, they look very similar and they apparently had a lifestyle very similar to wolves, mm -hmm. a little bit somewhat the size of a coyote to a wolf somewhere in there. Uh, sadly, the, uh, the Europeans, uh, well, sadly, they were wiped out by humans in the last few thousand years. It's very sad. They're almost surely gone, although occasionally there's a report of something like one. But uh, mm -hmm. anyway, it's it's a dead ringer for a wolf. And so it's an example of convergent evolution. And you can uh, find many examples of marsupials in Australia that have parallels in the rest of the world. There's something called the sugar glider, which is essentially a flying squirrel. Mm -hmm. it, again, if you know flying squirrels and you saw a sugar glider, you'd think it was a flying squirrel. Mm 
Hmm. Or there's another thing called a numbat that is very similar to an anteater, a wombat, pretty similar to a groundhog, and so on. You can make a whole list of these parallel evolutionary developments, these convergent animals, marsupials in Australia, placentals in the rest of the world. Hmm. And these are, you talk about in the book how species can be convergent phenotypically, but then they can also be convergent and evolved by genes and behavior. So talk about kind of the, the two kinds of, or I guess the three ways in which, you know, that can happen, right? With genes and phenotypes, but then also with behavior. How, how do we see convergent evolution working in those two kinds of ways? Well, there, um, there's a couple, I want to answer that in a couple different ways. So let me unpack sure. that. Uh, sure, sure. First, behavior in many respects uh, is determined by genes, particularly when you're looking at major behavioral differences among animals. And so uh, behavior can evolve just like any other trait. And so certainly you can get uh, convergences in behaviors, just like you can have convergences in physiology, anatomy, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so uh, people uh, tend to focus more on the anatomy or physiology because it's much easier to see, but there certainly are examples of, of species that, um, you know, that evolve the same behaviors. Um, for example, many rodents independently have evolved to dig burrows underground and, and live in a tunneling lifestyle. One example that just pops into my head. Mm -hmm. Or some of the lizards I study, uh, some species behave, they're very uh, active and they, and they uh, go traveling all over the place looking for, for food to eat, others are very sedentary and they sit and wait to ambush their prey. So, the, so behavior can converge like, uh, like any other trait. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about the genes that underlie behavior or physiology or anatomy, this is actually a question of great current interest. And the question is, um, is this, when two species evolve similar structures, whatever they are, similar phenotypes, you know, as we refer to the, the characteristics of an organism, does that convergence occur by the same genetic change? Are they converging at the genotypic level as well as the phenotypic level? Or do they find different genetic changes that lead to the same outcome? Mm. And uh, there's a lot of research on this right now. And, and again, the answer is mixed. Mm. Sometimes Remarkably, the same gene changes to cause the same outcome. Sometimes the exact same mutation occurs, uh, uh, which I said remarkably, but some people might expect that. Well, of course, if it's the same phenotype, it's the same genes. Perhaps it's more remarkable that sometimes very complex traits that are convergent uh, achieve this convergence by very different genetic changes. So it turns out there are many different ways to build an organism that you you can, there are many different genetic ways often to produce the same outcome. And sometimes that happens as well. Mm. One generality that seems to be true about convergence is the more closely related two species are, or even populations in a species, the more likely they are to converge by, by using the same genetic changes. Mm. The, the more likely convergence at the phenotypic level is likely to be the result of convergence at the genotypic level. I didn't say that very clearly. The more closely they are, the more likely that genetic convergence underlies phenotypic convergence. Whereas the more distantly related, the more likely that they have used different genetic changes to achieve phenotypic convergence is it, as a generality. Yeah, so, so maybe could you give an example of maybe how we, we, we see that, whether it's with, uh, you see that with certain types of uh, lizards that you work with or, or with uh, any, any, any type of reptiles or birds, or maybe just give an example of the closeness and, the, and the, how they're more distant. Uh, sure. So uh, on, the, on the closeness side of things, uh, people have studied populations of the same species or very closely related species. So these are species that are very closely related or populations. And what they find is that often the, the, the genetic changes are identical or very similar. For example, people have looked at um, stickleback fish. There's a little fish that occurs in ponds and streams throughout much of the Northern Hemisphere. And depending on the circumstances, uh, one circumstance that matters a lot is uh, the presence of predators. And when there are predators, they evolve spines to make it harder for them to, to be eaten. And it turns out that they very often use the same genes to evolve spines time and time again. 
And so that's one of close, these are diff different populations of the same species. Um, similar work has been done with mice, uh, a type of field mouse that evolves a light color when it lives on beaches and sandy areas. And again, it's very often that they use the same genes to achieve that uh, light color. Hmm. So those are a couple of examples of closely related populations in this case, using the same gen genes to, to converge. On the other hand, a great example of the opposite phenomenon, it turns out that there are um, a number of fish and other organisms that are able to survive living in water that is, is at or below freezing. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the ocean, water that's slightly below 32 Fahrenheit won't freeze uh, because of the various chemicals in it, the salt and so on. But that's very cold. Um, and it turns out that a number of these fish have evolved essentially antifreeze proteins in their bloodstream that, that keep the body from freezing. And it's, it is essentially antifreeze. And when you look at these different uh, species that have done that, the antifreezes are pretty similar in their chemical constitution, but they have been evolved from, in some cases, very different predecessors. Very, in some case, from, uh, from, I believe, proteins that were involved in digestion. In other case, from proteins that, very different proteins that have di a different previous function. And so they have managed to get the same end result uh, by very starting with a very different uh, starting point. Mm. And, and those fish, I should add, are, are distantly related fish species. It's, it's completely fascinating because it seems as if there's still this kind of uh, compatibility of sorts of, yes, these uh, species, can they, they can be distant and they can have some underlying uh, genetic components, but it also is with the ways in which the environment is also pooling or, or maybe switching on how the genes can work, such as with the field uh, mice getting lighter color. But that, I would imagine that has to be uh, based on, partially based on the environment in which they're in, but also with how they have the genetic kind of imprint of how they're able to kind of be able to do that. So it sounds like in, in all the scenarios you're giving, there's this kind of uh, compatibility of sorts or this potential compatibility with the, you know, the genotypes and also the uh, elements of the environment as well. It sounds like they're working in tandem in these situations. Well, yes, and um, th that leads, you know, the, the great debate, the term you used earlier is determinism. Mm -hmm. And one of the debates people have had is to what extent uh, is the outcome of evolution affected by the starting condition? And it could, could a species evolve any possible outcome? And so some people argue no, that a species has its own genetic constitution and so on. And that limits what's possible, that you can only evolve in certain directions because you have genes that work in certain ways. And so uh, there are only certain outcomes that, that can be produced. Other people argue that natural selection is extremely powerful and that with a genome of several billion base pairs, as most species have, the possible combinations of those genes and mutations is is almost is is very large, such that just about any possible any possible outcome given enough time could occur, and so that they would argue that that the only thing determining evolution is the power of natural selection, whereas the pe other people would argue no, there are constraints on evolution that natural selection is limited by the working materials that it has at hand. If, does that make sense? What oh, I'm oh, it makes complete sense. My, I have two points here. Is the first point is maybe I don't want to say both are right, but maybe it's one of those things where yes, natural selection with all the different you know billion base pairs is true. There's the potential that could happen, but it doesn't mean it necessarily will happen. And so maybe there's a there's a kind of weird nuance because I think we see that with a lot of you know different you know things that where things go wrong or certain diseases it's like well why would this person get in this person what if, but I guess the other thing about that is I'm going to assume that this is kind of mixed right so what do we actually see in the wild what do we actually see in the lab about whether these I don't want to say confirm or deny these hypotheses but I'm going to assume <laughs> that there are mixed results on this, right? And that people are extrapolating from, we'll see, aha, this is proving this aspect, or no, this is actually proving this one. 
uh, but from the, the actual uh, quantitative and qualitative data that we have in different, uh, you know, in the wild and in the lab, I'm going to assume that we have mixed results about uh, whether these two kinds of uh, main hypotheses are confirmed or denied. Is, is that about right? Yeah, that's absolutely true. There's evidence for both. And again, it's the, as you just said, there's some of both. And the question is trying to figure out when one is the most important and when the other. So I guess the, the, the really important question here is, uh, you know, people may have fun debating this, but I guess it becomes important in, in terms of understanding not only more about the natural world, but also understanding how we can have preventative measures for certain species that are endangered or, or their, um, their homes and their environment are, are being um, imposed on by other forces, natural or, or man-made. And then also, if you go to organisms like uh, humans, um, the same. How do we understand how these things are so that way we can have better ways of preventing certain things from happening? That, that would seem to be like the holy grail of sorts of the question, more so of which side is right. It's more of, well, how do we have a clear understanding so that we can have more uh, preventative uh, ways of trying to make sure um, people don't get sick or endangered or eradicated, et cetera? Is, is that probably the more important question or, or how do you see it? Absolutely. And the, the last thing you said, I think, is really hits home these days that understanding how microbes evolve is very important because, as we all know, microbes affect our lives in many ways. And mm -hmm. Um, when I wrote my book, the topic that people were really focusing on was the ability of various uh, microbes to evolve resistance to our, our antibiotics. That, as you know, various diseases uh, are caused by microbes, and we developed antibiotics to kill them, but the microbes then turn around and evolve resistance to those antibiotics. And this is a huge problem for us. And so it's kind of an arms race of sort. We developed these these weapons, these chemicals, the microbes evolve away around it, around it. Then we have to find a way to, uh, to defeat their new approach. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that scientists have done with a variety of these microbes is to try to understand how do they evolve resistance? Mm -hmm. And here is, here is a clear example of, whether, of where convergent evolution has real importance. Because if the microbes do it the same way, time after time, then it's not that hard to figure out how to how to beat them. But if they do it a different way every single time, if they use different genes and different mutations, well, that means that we have to study each case on a case-by-case -case basis and figure out how are we going to counteract that. And that's a much more challenging task. And what the uh, biomedical researchers have found is, like everything else I've talked about, there's a mix. In some cases, there are some general rules that are followed time and time again by the microbes, and that makes it easier to work on countermeasures. And sometimes they just seem to be doing things willy-nilly and there's no obvious general pattern. Now, of course, this is particularly relevant where we are right today in the middle of the pandemic with this rapidly evolving uh, COVID, COVID virus. Um, it's not a microbe, it's a virus, but the principles are more or less the same. Mm -hmm. And as we've seen where we sit right now with Omicron coming out of nowhere, a very different type of strain than we had seen before that. Well, this is uh, COVID has been a, a real boon to evolutionary biologists in having such a well-documented, we have sequenced the genome of so many of these uh, different strains and different types that we're really understanding the evolution of this virus better than probably any other organism we've ever studied. And so the real question will be, is there any predictability? Can we figure out any general principles that will allow us to get ahead of this? Or are we just gonna have to re react every time something new comes along? We've seen this with the flu. Mm -hmm. uh, we've studied the flu intensively, and yet it, every few years it surprises us. Something happens we didn't predict. And so hopefully with our knowledge of COVID, we can, that won't be the case, that we can begin to figure out how it's going to evolve, at least in general ways before it does. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I, I think that's the the importance of understanding the the components of of convergent evolution. And yes, like you're as you're saying, the 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 biomedical field is really having a <laughs> they're, they're not going to be out of a job anytime soon trying to figure out how do we have preventative uh, measures for these for these types of things. 
So two, two questions here are kind of, uh, I guess, somewhat similar, but is you talk about speciation, right? And, you know, why that's so complicated. And then you also talk about adaptive radiation. And so maybe just talk about those two concepts and, and why they're, they're important for understanding uh, convergent evolution. Well, sure. Um, speciation is the process by which new species evolve, which uh, we normally think about happening as one species somehow dividing into two species. You have an ancestor and then you have two descendant species. And there's a lot of research on how does this actually happen? What environmental aspects trigger speciation? How does it occur genetically? And it turns out, again, there are lots of different factors that come into play in speciation. But if you want to talk about evolution, you have to include speciation because that's how, how diversity comes to be. That's how we came from a single ancestor of all life to the millions of species around us today. So that's one aspect. Now, adaptive radiation is the phenomenon when one ancestral species diversifies to produce descendant species that are very diverse and, and occupy different parts of the environment with different adaptations for those parts of the environment. Uh, an example, we were just talking about the marsupials in Australia, where an ancestral marsupial gave rise to all of these very different types, um, or the placental mammals. Again, look at all the great diversity from elephants to aardvarks to whales, all are the uh, descendants of a single ancestral species. And so that's the phenomenon of adaptive radiation. Now, at that grand level of large groups of major groups of, of life, of course, it's it's obvious that there's a great diversity of things, but it's hard to study what happened 50 or 75 million years ago. Many researchers like, like me study smaller adaptive radiations where in my case, a group of lizards on islands in the Caribbean have evolved to produce a variety of, of lizard species adapted some high in the tree, some on the ground, some on twigs, and that have evolved different uh, anatom anatomical structures for living in different parts of the environment, different behaviors, and so on. And so that's adaptive radiation at a smaller scale. Hmm. Well, yeah, it's, I was, I was going to ask about your your work specifically, because this is where this kind of really comes to, into play here, is you mentioned it in the book, I would think that so many evolutionary biologists really like islands to <laughs> study evolution. And I think you mentioned it is that Madagascar is this almost like kind of mini continent, um, where it's just it's an island off the east coast of uh, the continent of Africa. And, uh, and it just has so much uh, diversity uh, in terms of, of many different types of organisms. And so what, what is, how does on, I guess on islands, but I guess in general, but I mean, we can talk about islands, you can talk about your work here with, with different lizards. How does evolution actually move fast, strong, and in a short period of time? Most people would think it's the opposite, right? That it's very slow and, you know, it has variants and it's very long over a period of time. But how do we understand evolution in kind of those ways? Well, the thing that's great about islands to study evolution is that they are, uh, I use a term I used before, independent theaters of evolution. And so imagine an island, many islands in the world are created by volcanoes. Underwater volcanoes uh, produce a landmass that eventually, it starts in the bottom of the sea, it eventually builds up so it's above the water level. And you have this new empty rock. And over time, organisms get there. And obviously the first thing that need to get there are plants to create an ecosystem. And then all kinds of insects and other invertebrates and then vertebrate animals. And they build up a, uh, a community on these islands. Uh, but because they're in the ocean, those islands have a relatively limited number of species. They're just the ones that have the ability to get there across water and then just the luck that they got there and got established. Mm -hmm. And so if you can imagine, imagine an island covered with plants, um, but no animals. And the first animals that get there, it's a wide open, uh, a theater of a wide open cornucopia of food and things to do. Mm -hmm. I and mean, imagine say, say the Galapagos Islands, say mm -hmm. off the coast of, mm -hmm. of South America. Mm -hmm. Well, suppose a, a insect, from South America manages to get to the Galapagos. That's 600 miles off the coast. Mm -hmm. um, now, where that insect lives, say in the Andes or somewhere in South America, there are lots of different 
uh, insects and other animals, each one with its own narrow ecological place, its niche, we call it. Mm -hmm. And so that means that this particular species doesn't have a lot of options because all the other niches, it's living with all these other organisms that are using the resources. But then it gets to the Galapagos and there are all these resources and no other insects around to eat them. And so it's a great opportunity for this insect to diversify, to evolve, to use all these different resources. And so that's what happens in, in, in we, we, if we use this very clever term, we call it ecological opportunity. They get there, there are all these different things available and so they evolve to take advantage of them. And so that can lead to adaptive radiation. And that's in fact, more or less what happens on many islands. And so that makes it easier to study because if all of these insects are one type of insect, you can, you can figure out what happened much more easily uh, because they're, they're, they're similar in a way, and probably it happened more recently in geological terms. And so it makes it easier to figure out, to, to infer what happened in the past. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, that leads to the other question you asked about the speed of evolution. Um, we tend to think of evolution as occurring very slowly. And part of the reason we think that is that that's what Charles Darwin said. Back when he wrote On the Origin of Species, he said that evolution occurs at a glacial pace. So, so slowly that over the, the lapse of many ages, that has to occur before any perceptible change would occur. Um, and so because Darwin said that, that had an, a strong influence for well over a century. Um, but if you think about it, when Darwin wrote his book, which came out in 1859, there were no data, there was no evidence about the pace of evolution because no one was studying it, no one even heard of it. And so he didn't have any data to form his uh, conclusions. He was actually borrowing from sort of from what we thought, how we thought geology worked and uh, Victorian sensibilities of the time that in which change was not a good thing. They thought change should go very slowly instead of turning the world upside down. And so that's where Darwin got that idea. Now, some of my colleagues tell me I should not say that Darwin was wrong about anything, it's as, if, <laughs> as if he was a omnipotent right. super genius. And the fact is he was amazing at the number of things he got right mm -hmm. uh, from all kinds of phenomena, uh, not just evolution by natural selection, but how earthworms create, uh, create soil, how coral atolls form, a variety of other, he was incredibly perceptive. But you know what? He didn't know everything. He was completely wrong about genetics. He had a guess yeah. about how genetics work, completely wrong. And he, he was wrong about the pace of evolution. We now know that when natural selection is strong, evolution can occur very rapidly. And we've seen that in antibiotic resistance I mentioned before, and, mm -hmm. and many other organisms evolving to respond to the insults humans have caused on the environment. And we also know that it occurs on islands, that when species find themselves in a place where there are lots of new resources, well, that's a strong natural selection pressure to take advantage of those. And in those cases, evolution can occur very rapidly as well. Mm. It's, it's very interesting what you say about islands. I've, I've been to uh, two myself. I've been to Iceland, which is a wonderful place. It's a, it's a magical place in some ways. It's, it's, you know, so much the environment and the terrain changes every hour. It feels like if you're driving, it just feels very different, you know, but I've been to the Galapagos as well. I've been very yeah. fortunate to go to the Galapagos. Excellent. Yeah. It's, it's really, really, you know, I, I hate saying this, right. But you know, it's just a, a silly pop culture reference, but it does kind of feel like an incredible, like Jurassic park kind of place. I mean, it's just a, you see all of there, so there's really no predators, is my understanding uh, on on the Galapagos Islands, which you don't really think about. Um, uh, well, I had I didn't think about it in that way, but then when I saw all different types of animals, totally not blocked off, that I mean it's their home, but seeing so many animals coexist was, you know, mind blowing to me. Right to see sea lions and to see all these different types of birds you never see anywhere else on the planet. Um, you know, all the marine iguanas, they've evolved to swim. Like, it's interesting to see all of these different types of animals uh, coexist in, in, a, in a pretty, uh, you know, good way, seemingly. And so, in terms of talking about that theater and this kind of way of like, they take this advantage, right? Uh, of, well, you know, here's this place that's kind of untouched and new and, and it's it, you know, Galapagos obviously sit in a really interesting part of the world. So this is very interesting how they have um, particular, you know, species there that have evolved. And so it, it is interesting to see 
um, again, how what you're saying that evolution can move, you know, fast and, and strong and, and doesn't need to take at a glacier pace. It can be, um, you know, much faster. I, I guess the, the one thing is, is I'm curious about is in your book, you, you kind of, um, you split the, the last two parts of the book into two sections, right? Which is how do we understand convergent evolution in the wild and how do we understand it in the lab? So, uh, you, you talk about it, um, You've mentioned already the the stickles fish and the uh, the Nebraska field uh, mouse, but I want to ask uh, about your work uh, with the anoles. Is this correct? And yes, the no, the yes. leg uh, length and how they adjust based on the vegetation differences in the environment, etc. And I think this was on was this in Costa Rica or Jamaica or both? I can't remember where this uh, was was done. It was more Jamaica and the Bahamas. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, just tell us about um, about your work with with those uh, creatures and uh, the leg length and how that helps us understand within their environment and some of the convergent uh, evolution properties. Sure, but do you mind if I go back to the Galapagos for one yeah, second? Yeah, please. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, it's yeah. Actually, a great example of several of the things that I, I I've said. And so, a very common type of bird in the Galapagos is something that's now called Darwin's finches. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there are. 14 species of them, and you undoubtedly saw some of them when you were there. Oh, I went, I went to two different islands. I wasn't able to go to to all of them. It's a, That's difficult to do, especially the ones that sit a little bit higher up. But I can remember, I was looking for it. So, But I remember seeing the finches on the main island, and forgetting the name, or one of the bigger islands. And then when we went to the other island, um, also finches, but look completely different in some ways, right? And you see yeah. the, 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 I mean, not wildly different, but they were, they were, there were distinctive features that would say, oh, you might think this was a different type of bird almost, right? Or whatever, but it is the yeah. same type with the different types of beak. Fascinating, it's really fascinating to see it in, 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 the, in the wild. <laughs> so as you say, the differences, well, those differences fooled Darwin mm -hmm. that when he traveled around the world and visited the Galapagos, he saw those birds, he collected some specimens and he thought that they were a great variety of birds like he was familiar with in Europe. Mm -hmm. He thought some were finches, which had these big beaks to crush seeds, but he also saw, saw some warblers, which have very thin beaks to, uh, to catch insects. And then he saw some that looked, uh, that looked like a fruit eating bird with a massive fruit crushing beak and so on. And uh, there's a type of bird called a gross beak, which uh, has a big, that eats really big seeds and has a massive beak. And so he said, well, we've got all these same types of birds just like we see in Europe. And he said, and they belong to the different families of birds as they do in Europe. So he collected specimens, he took them back to England. And one of the world's greatest ornithologists at the time, a guy named John Gould, looked at the specimens and said, Darwin, you got it wrong. These are all one type of bird found nowhere else in the world that have uh, just have these different adaptations. Yeah. And that is an example of adaptive radiation. And, and it is probably the most famous example. Mm -hmm. But it also shows that the type of bird that first got there, a finch, they occur throughout North and South America and so on. They're finches. And we, you have them in your backyard if you have a bird feeder. But they can't evolve to be a warbler because warblers also occur in these places. Warbler, warblers, it's hard to say that. Warblers uh, already fill that niche. And so finches don't have the opportunity to do that. And there are fruit eating birds that already fill that niche. And so mm -hmm. finches stay in their lane, but you put them in the Galapagos where none of those other things occur and they diversify to take on all of those different lifestyles. So the Galapagos are a fantastic mm -hmm. example mm -hmm. of evolution. Uh, and, and you can see it right before your eyes. Um, and so I, I visited the Galapagos as well, and it's just spectacular. It, it is spectacular. And it, may, it reminds me of what you were saying earlier is, well, did they have that genetic component to always make that switch? And it wasn't until they got there that then that came online because it needed to, or, or they had to, to figure it out. You know, that's 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 uh, kind of another applied way of, of trying to answer that question of like, well, there's an example of, you know, do, how, will we know? I, I, I'm not sure. But that's a kind of maybe an applied way of, of asking that question. Yes. So but that leads to the question that you asked me that I ignored for now, but I'll get back to. And, that you know, what in an ideal world, a scientist would take this question you just asked, you know, did finches always have that capacity? Well, let's say, well, let's do an experiment. Let's take a finch and put it on an empty island somewhere and wait a few million years and see what happens. Well, of course, that's impossible. And so that's, that's been frustrating to, um, to evolutionary biologists because we would like to do experiments, but it, it's so difficult. And in fact, there are people who 
who um, do experiments in the laboratory with rapidly reproducing organisms like microbes or fruit flies and so on to try to test some of these ideas. And maybe we'll get back to that in a minute, but well, let me get to the lizards because yeah. uh, you know, I've yeah. avoided the question long enough. Um, <laughs> So my, uh, my research for many years, building on the work of others, looked at the lizards. There's a type of lizard called an anolis lizard. And if you have ever lived in the southeastern United States, Florida or Georgia or Louisiana or you know, the southeast, you have seen these lizards. Or if you visited on vacation islands in the Caribbean. Hmm. And the most obvious feature of these lizards is they have a little, the males, have a little structure underneath their neck on their throat that they can pull out. It's called a throat fan. And so when two males are interacting aggressively, they will posture and they will raise their body and they'll look really tough and they'll pull this thing out and it's sending a message. I'm a tough guy. This is my territory. Stay away. Hmm. Or when a male is trying to court a female, again, he will have various behaviors and he will stick this, the structure is called a dewlap out. And so anyway, if you've ever seen this in Florida or anywhere around there, those are the lizards that, that I've done my research on. And it turns out that these lizards are particularly common on the large islands in the Caribbean. And by the large ones, I mean Cuba, Hispaniola, which is the island that the Dominican Republic and Haiti are on, mm -hmm. Puerto Rico, and Jamaica. And each of these islands have a whole bunch of these species. At the extreme in Cuba, there are now, I think, 64 species of anolis lizards. Wow. Um, and you can find many different species living in a single place that you can find five or six or sometimes as many as 11 coexisting species. And these coexisting species live in different parts of the environment. Um, you'll have one that lives on tree trunks near the ground and runs around on the ground a lot. Uh, you'll have some that use twigs, others high in the canopy on leaves some that, that live in grass blades and things like that. So they live in different environments and each species has anatomy that's appropriate to where it lives. But the ones that run quickly on the ground have very long legs that allow them to, to move quickly. And the ones that live on twigs have very short legs that allows them, allow them to move with great agility on, on narrow, irregular surfaces. And the ones up high in the tree in the canopy, they're often green to blend in with the greenery. And they have big toe pads, which allow them to stick to smooth surfaces. Whereas the ones on the ground uh, are often brown and they, they don't have much in the way of toe pads. They do have them, they're just not that big. So species have adapted to where they live in terms of their anatomy, in terms of their behavior and so on. And so that, that it's an adaptive radiation, the, the concept I've told you about already. Now, the really interesting thing is if you go, let's say I just described to you the lizards in Puerto Rico. If you went into the rainforest in the Luquillo Mountains in Puerto Rico and sat quietly uh, for a few minutes, the lizards would forget you were there and they would become active. And looking around, you would see, oh, there's a species up in the canopy, the big green one. Oh, and there's one on the twigs. It's very narrow and very well camouflaged. And so you'd see the different species. Uh, and you'd say, oh, what a great adaptive radiation. Then suppose you went to Cuba, if, if we could get in there, um, and you went into the forest there, did the same thing, sat quietly. Sure enough, you would seem to be, see the same set of habitat specialists. Oh, yeah, I remember that one near, that lives on the, that runs on the ground. It looks just like the one on Puerto Rico. Oh, there's a twig one, looks just like the one in Puerto Rico, and so on. Um, so you say, well, the same set of habitat specialists occur on both islands. But then the very cool thing is if you went and sequenced their DNA to look at how the species were related to each other, I think the, you're going into this, your idea would be, well, the twig anoles, they're so similar on the two islands, they must be closely related, that their DNA is probably very similar, indicating recent evolutionary relationship. And the, one, the green ones up in the canopy on the two islands, they must be similar. Well, in fact, that's not the case at all. Quite the contrary, it seems that for the most part, the lizards on the four islands have evolved independently on each island. So for example, the, uh, the ground species, let's say the, one, the green one up in the canopy on each island, even though they look similar across the four islands, they actually, in each case, are more similar to other species on their own island than they are to the similar ones across the islands. Mm. That these have been four different adaptive radiations that nonetheless have produced the same evolutionary outcome 
with a few exceptions, but more or less the same outcome time and time again. And so it's an example of, these are of course examples of convergent evolution, the convergent green ones high in the canopy, the convergent twig and oles, but this is convergence of an entire adaptive radiation that has occurred multiple times. I mean, it's just absolutely spectacular, right? Because as you, you, you tell the, the, the narrative uh, uh, in a way uh, very, very wonderfully because it's, I was, you would think, yes, well, you know, they must have very similar genome sequences and very similar ancestry, et cetera. And that's, I, I can imagine when, when whomever first, you know, did, did that and realized that would, would say, well, what does this mean? <laughs> If they're so different, you know, there, there's enough distance there. What could we make of this? And then again, I think a, a really satisfactory answer is that is a an example in the world, in 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 the wild of convergent evolution, right? Different species having you know evolving similar features to uh, to to uh, um, live in a similar environment, which is. And we get, it's just spectacular to 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 see that, and it's it's spectacular to see that in in a in, a, in an organism that's so so small. It's 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 it's, it's really 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 cool to see um, how that how that works. So it's just yeah, it's just kind of mind blowing. Well, cool. I, I my, blew my mind as well when I first learned about it. So, but, get, go yes, ahead. go ahead. No, I was going to say about the the leg length uh, adjustment, yes. right? Because that's that's the next part I was going to ask about. Uh, you talk about it in the book, and so just describe how, I mean, again, very, very, very tall, or excuse me, small uh, uh, pads on their toes or, or or their feet, however you describe it, and their and their and their legs. Uh, just describe that and how how the leg length will adjust based on whether they're in the trees or on the ground or or wherever they're at. Yeah. So let's talk about leg length. So you have these. So if you saw a lizard that lived on the ground, it looks like a normal lizard. Uh, you, you wouldn't uh, look twice at it. But if you see the twig ones, which can be harder to find because they're well camouflaged, they are very elongate, slender lizards with very short legs. And so that, uh, that allows them to, to move over narrow surfaces with great agility. And we know from... Um, from our evolutionary studies, we're looking at the DNA, that the twig species have evolved from longer legged ones independently on each island. That that's been the, the, the direction of evolution from long legs to short legs. And um, the short legged ones live on narrow surfaces. And so the fact that four times short legged species have evolved to use narrow surfaces suggests that short legs are an adaptation for living on narrow surfaces. Um, and that's a reasonable uh, presumption given this convergence. Moreover, we have done functional studies to ask what good are short legs? And it turns out that short legs are really bad for running fast. Surprise, mm -hmm. surprise. Mm -hmm. So on a broad surface, longer legged lizards can run faster and presumably that's better for catching prey and avoiding predators and so on. But that advantage entirely disappears on narrow surfaces. On a narrow surface, uh, long-legged ones and short-legged ones can run the same speed. And, uh, but there is an advantage to having short legs on narrow surfaces, and that is you stumble less often, that is, if you're a lizard. And we've actually done uh, video recordings to see this. And what happens as they're moving along, a long-legged lizard's legs are too long. And so when it reaches underneath the body to try to grab the twig, sometimes it just misses. And so it's really kind of hilarious. You see this long-legged lizard running on a narrow surface and it just topples and sometimes completely falls off the twig because it misses the, <laughs> the handhold it needs. Yeah. Whereas short-legged ones, they, they, don't, uh, you know, they don't have that problem in narrow surfaces. They're very sure-footed, we call them. And so, uh, so it makes sense that short legs would evolve as an adaptation to using narrow surfaces. However, still, this is just what we call correlational evidence. Mm. And that the fact that every time they, they use narrow surfaces, they evolve short legs, that's a correlation. And one thing, one statement we always say as scientists is, is that correlation does not prove causation. It suggests that that one is necessarily related to the other, but it's not proof of it because mm. There, 
there are other possible explanations. And so the gold standard in science in general for the last century plus has been to do an, an experiment. That's how you test for causation. You change one factor and see if you get the predicted result. And so that's what may, has made science so successful for more than a century. But uh, it's difficult to do experiments in evolution, particularly if you think evolution takes eons, because then what's the point? You'd have to wait for your great, 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 great grandchild to see the results. Uh, <laughs> right. So, but that, that is, that's been the problem. The ideal thing would be to do an experiment where, say, you took a long-legged lizard, put it in an environment where it has to use narrow surfaces and see if short legs evolve. I guess my one question I have here on, on this on this point about the leg length and, and just about the these type of uh, lizards in general is how much to, I mean as far as we know is this there there are different species evolving differently but I guess how how much time are we seeing this over time so this isn't taking millions of years right this isn't this is taking hundreds of years in terms of time of how they've done this what can we say about the 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 aspect of the length of time, I guess, that, that we know or, or speculate, uh, this has taken them to adapt? Well, so that is a, a question that initially we didn't know the answer to. And I think many people would have thought, well, this probably took a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. When you look at the difference between a twig anole and a, and a trunk ground anole, one that lives on tree trunks and runs on the ground a lot, they're pretty different looking. Even someone who doesn't pay attention to lizards, if you put the two in front of them, they say, wow, that's quite a difference. Mm -hmm. And so um, you might think, well, that must take a really long time to evolve. Um, so we didn't know. And then what actually happened is um, in the 1970s, a scientist at the University of California, Davis, a, a great ecologist named Tom Shainer, uh, was traveling through the Bahamas, studying the the uh, the ecosystems on different islands. And one of the things he noticed was that the very common lizard on these islands called the brown anole uh, occurred just about everywhere, but not on the smallest islands. And when I say small islands, we're talking to islands maybe the size of a baseball infield. Uh, so you know, they're found on every island except the really smallest ones. And so Shainer had, working with his wife at the time, Amy Shainer, had the idea of let's put some brown anoles on these really tiny islands where they don't occur to study the process of extinction, because obviously they can't live there. So mm. let's watch them go extinct and, and try to understand how extinction occurs, which mm. is something we still need to know about today. And so he collected some of the brown anoles and put them on these tiny islands. And I should point out that in the Bahamas, there are hundreds of very small islands varying in size. And so he didn't bring in lizards that didn't occur in an area. He just brought in a lizard from the next island over, you know, 100 yards away that happened to be bigger. And so he was mimicking the process of colonization of islands that goes on all the time. Mm -hmm. So he put the lizards on these tiny islands and he, he and his wife followed uh, the islands, the populations for five years. And what they found, much to their surprise, was that on all but the smallest islands, the populations did just fine. They survived, and in many cases, they increased greatly in population size. So basically, islands larger than maybe a pitcher's mound, or maybe a little bit bigger, but on any island larger than that, these lizards were able to establish a population that could persist. Now, you might ask, why weren't they found on these islands? Uh, Naturally, then. Well, the answer, it turns out, uh, we found out in the last uh, 20 years, is it's because of hurricanes. Every now and then a hurricane comes along, and the really small islands are also low lying, and they just get washed clear. Mm. And then over time, the lizards recolonize those islands because they can float across water. And so there's this dynamic. But that's why the small islands generally are, are empty. It's not that the populations can't survive. It's just that hurricanes wash them away. That's a side note. Mm. Anyway, so Shainer did the study, he put the lizards on the islands, most of the islands, the populations were established. I learned about this study when I was beginning my own studies in graduate school. And I thought that was very cool. And so um, 
as I was finishing my graduate studies, I wrote Shainer a letter. And this is back in the days where you actually wrote letters, no email, none of that. <laughs> uh, and I said, basically, has it occurred to you that you've done, you've set up an evolution experiment? Because these small islands probably vary in their vegetation from one island to the next. Mm. And we know that over millions of years, species that use different surfaces, lizard species of this sort, evolve differences in leg length. And so maybe you've done an experiment where we can see this process beginning to happen. Um, and he responded in the way that I could only have hoped for my wildest dreams, but never really expected to happen. He said, that's a great idea. Why don't you come work with me at, in Davis and we'll, we'll go back to the islands and see what's happened. Right. And so that's what I did. We went back to the islands, uh, which he was monitoring every year for other reasons. And I, I measured the length of the legs of the lizards on different islands. And just as I'd expected, the islands did vary in their vegetation that some of them were covered with scraggly little vege vegetation with all narrow surfaces for the lizards. Others had small trees and thicker bushes where they were perching on broader, broader uh, surfaces. So that there was the variation among the islands. We measured the different lizards and sure enough, they differed in leg length just as we predicted that the lizards using the islands with the only narrow vegetation had shorter legs than the lizards on the broader vegetation. Now this had happened over a period of only 14 years. So it was quite rapid. Now I do have to say the differences in leg length weren't huge. It's not like they had turned into twigginals. Uh, in fact, if I showed you two of these lizards from the two islands, just with your naked eye, you might say they look the same. Um, but when you measure them, sure enough, there was a very clear difference. And so that indicated that over very short periods of time, strong natural selection pressures can lead to the change in the way we predicted. And so the point here was we were able to take this, uh, this phenomenon we see among species that have been diverging for a million years and able to test whether the causal explanation we had was correct. And our evidence seemed to suggest that it was, that lizards do evolve leg length to adapt to the surfaces they use. Hmm. It's it's super powerful to show how doing experiments in, in in nature in the wild can give us some answers about how we understand how various species evolve. I, I guess the, the the one thing I want to end with here a, a little bit is is a uh, experiments that we do in the lab, right? You talk about this in the you know last third of your book. Um, so I guess I just want to get right to the, the main piece of it is first off, you say that that selection can be weak and probabilistic sometimes. And so how in, in lab selection, right? How is that different, right? So obviously we can control things, we can manipulate things, weed out variables, factor variables in, et cetera. But how do we understand the kind of ins and outs of how lab selection is different and how can we make strong or maybe less, not so much, but you know, strong, uh, uh, conclusions about certain things in a, in a controlled environment like the lab? Well, so the way that people do selection experiments in the lab, usually, the way it's been done for a century, it, you know, the, the classic animal for these studies, going back a century, is the fruit fly. And so the way they would do, say you want to select for um, longer wings in a fruit fly. Well, you would take a big population of fruit flies in the lab, and you'd measure how long their wings are. Mm. And then you would take maybe the 5% of the flies with the longest wings and save them and get rid of all the rest. And they will let those, that 5% breed with each other. And then you do the same thing. And again, you take the 5% longest wings and you do that generation after generation. Well, that is extremely strong selection. It's throwing away 95% of the animals just based on one trait. It's very strong selection probably much stronger than evolution, than, than what occurs in natural selection in nature. Uh, for if, if for no other reason, because natural selection probably is operating on many different traits. So it's important to survive how long your wings are, but maybe how long your legs are, or how well you smell, or how, you know, all kinds of traits. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that any one trait selection isn't that strong because it's, it's operating on many different traits. Um, so selection in the wild, in many cases, is not nearly as strong as in the lab. But you, you, you put this very strong selection in the lab, and you get very quick evolutionary change. We've known that 
for a century now. You select on just about anything in fruit flies and you can get an evolutionary response. Not everything, but almost everything. Hmm. And that's, so we know that when selection is strong in the lab, you get fast evolutionary change. But people thought that that was unnatural, that you didn't see such strong selection in nature. And that's why you wouldn't get fast evolutionary response. Hmm. I mean, it makes obviously in intuitive sense. I, I, the, the, the one uh, piece here that I know it's kind of complicated, so you can just kind of give us the broad brushstrokes if, if, if you want, is um, in the book, you mentioned the LTEE. -E. So tell us what yeah. that stands for and what that is and why that's been super important, um, you know, especially when, you know, if evolution is uh, predictable, mutations can be unpredictable. So you just kind of explain what it is and, and why it's so important for, for sure. looking at, at the lab selection. The, the LTEE stands for Long-Term Evolution Experiment. And it is an experiment that was set up um, by a, a scientist named Rich Lensky. And he started it in 1989. And basically the idea was to ask um, how, the question we've been talking about, how deterministic is evolution? And to do that, he realized that the, uh, the, the faster, the, the, the shorter the generation of a uh, organism, the faster you could do an evolution experiment because you could get more generations. And also the smaller an organism, uh, the larger the population size you can maintain and thus the more mutations will come along. And since, Genetic variation is required for evolution. The more mutations, presumably the faster evolution would occur. And so thinking about that, the obvious choice for it, the organism to do, to do your studies is a microbe. They're small, they have big populations, they, evolve very, uh, they can evolve very quickly. And so he chose to do his experiments on E. coli. Hmm. Now, E. coli gets a bad rap because it yes. can cause all kinds of diseases in humans. Right, but right. it turns out that E. coli is actually a very diverse that name applies to a very diverse group of microbes that in, in reality, it's probably many different species. And so he was studying a type of a strain of E. coli that is harmless to humans. Um, so uh, a harmless type of E. coli. And his experiment was exquisitely simple. He basically took a colony of E. coli that all had been created from a single cell. And so this colony were individuals that were essentially genetically identical. And he took a, a little, a few of those cells and he put them in a beaker and he gave them a, a broth in the be beaker for them to eat. And he, he didn't do this just once. He did this with, he, he 12 times went back to that ancestral beaker and took a, a few of them and started a new beaker. And so he had 12 flasks of E. coli that were starting out, they were completely identical genetically. Hmm. So starting out, exactly the same. And then what he did was he just uh, propagated those 12 lines generation after generation, not allowing them to mix. So it's as if a bird had occupied 12 different islands and then just bred independently. So mm -hmm. it was basically 12 different evolutionary uh, arenas. And his question was, would these 12 populations evolve in the same way or not over time? Now, the one other thing I need to tell you is that the food he gave them was a mixture of foods that they were not well adapted to. It was uh, just a mix that, that they weren't adapted to. And so he was expecting them to evolve to get better at eating the food that they, they had been given. And so the question is, would they adapt in the same way or not? And so he, he set the, well, here's how the experiment worked very briefly. There was enough food in the flask for the E. coli to replicate six times. And by, by replicate, that means when one cell basically breaks into two, that's how they reproduce. And then after six replications, um, they run out of food. And so they just sit there for the rest of the day doing nothing. And then every day they take out a sample from that flask and put it into a new flask full of food again. And so that, then they grow up again and replicate six times. So every day, six more generations. and to make a long story short, uh, he has been doing this, he and many colleagues have been doing this experiment for now more than 30 years. So six generations every day for 30 years. And so it's the longest running evolution experiment uh, in history, certainly the longest lab one. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And the question is, well, what's happened? Have they evolved in the same way or not? And the re results are really fascinating that for the first, I think it was 14 years, they certainly, they got better and better at eating this new food they got. And, and the way you can um, assess that is how big the population gets. Remember after six, uh, after six generations, they're, they're done for the day, but the better they are at eating what's in the, in the, uh, in the broth, the larger the population will be, the more efficient they are. And the population got bigger and bigger, but for 14 years, it seemed like the populations were adapting in more or less the same way. Uh, they, they, they followed the same curve of getting better through time. Their cells got a little larger and seem, seemingly the same way. It seemed to be strong evidence for evolutionary determinism, the same outcome time and time again. And then after 14 years, suddenly one day, uh, the person in charge of going in to change the, uh, the, the flasks noticed that one flask was very, uh, was very uh, opaque. Normally, even after the sixth generations, you would hold up the, the flask to the light and you could see through it. And that's because there weren't that many cells in there. But one flask was really hard to look through, which meant that there were a lot of microbes in that flask. So his initial thought was that it was contaminated, that something else had gotten in there and gone crazy, something better able to eat the food. But they did, they did tests and it was not contaminated. It was E. coli in there. So something had happened that those E. coli could develop a huge population. And, and this only happened in one of the 12 lines when he found one of the 12 beakers. Well, I need to get into the weeds just a little bit. Uh, so the food that was in those flasks included something called citrate. Now, E. coli cannot eat citrate in the presence of oxygen. Uh, that is a defining trait of E. coli. And so the reason the citrate, the citrate was in there, it has a chemical property that made the, the, uh, the, 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 the liquid in there behave properly, but it wasn't something for the E. coli to eat. And so it was just in there for various reasons. Well, to make a long story short, somehow one line of E. coli, one population had evolved the ability to eat citrate a major evolutionary advance because, because as, as I said, this was a defining character of E. coli that it can't eat citrate in the presence of oxygen and one population had developed the ability to do so. Wow. And so this showed that uh, sometimes adaptation does not converge and sometimes it happens a single time. And in fact, this happened in, I wanna say 2004, the, pop, the experiment has continued for now another 18 years none of the other 11 lines still have, have evolved that capability. Wow. And so it, in this case, it shows a non-deterministic, uh, yeah. what we call a contingent response. It happened in one line, but not the other 11. That's, uh, again, this is it's so incredible to think that there is, you know, how does, how does life find a way in that way, right? How does it, you know why and you know what what you know what was it you know about that one line and that's that's a so fascinating to just kind of sit with and think about you know at a at a small level like that happens and what happens at, at much larger levels i guess a, one question i have is is uh on this is knowing from the lte and how it's been in, in terms of the lab has there been any uh, juxtaposition between E. coli in the wild and E. coli in the lab that, that this study and ha look at some of the differences between them or, or obviously there's more variables to put in, but how does E. coli function in a lab study versus in a, in a wild study generally, I guess? Well, the people are trying to do that now, but it turns out that it's, it's very hard to study E. coli out in nature and, mm -hmm. and the environment is so variable from one place to the next, particularly as it may affect an E. coli, that two you know, pieces of dirt of, of you know, soil may seem identical to us, but slight differences in chemicals and so on may be really significant for E. coli. And so the, the magic of working in the lab is that you can be hyper-controlled about everything. And so you can, you can really isolate causal variables. Nature is messy. Um, yeah. And so people are now trying to take this sort of approach out to natural populations, or at least in more natural 
settings, even if it's in the in the lab. Uh, but that work is still in early days. Mm, yeah, yeah it'll be very interesting to see, you know, in the future how how we do that. I guess my last question is just kind of a general one: is um, you know, how do we you know we, we've understand the power of evolution for you know century and a half or whatever and. I guess so you, I think it's in the last chapter in the book. You kind of you know hint at this, but what do you think is the future of evolution on Earth? I mean, obviously we don't know, but based on what we do know from you know millions of years and and the possibility of of you know life on on other planets potentially having the capability of evolving, um, whether at a, at, a, at a small level or a bigger level and bigger organisms. So just kind of in general, as we look ahead, what are the things that where are, the, where are the places where we're going to continue to learn, whether it's in the lab or in the wild, more about evolution, about convergent evolution, and then even much broader outside of that to uh, maybe other, other, uh, other planets? So fascinating question. I'm going to answer it in three ways. Um, first, one of the big questions facing us today is humans are messing up the environment in so many ways. We're cutting down forests. We're polluting environments or of course causing global climate change. Mm -hmm. And some of this change is occurring on scales that have not happened for millions and millions of years. And many populations, many species are going extinct. And one question that we're asking is, can species evolve quickly enough to adapt to the new circumstances? And what we're finding is, in some cases, yes. Probably in most cases, no. That we're hitting species so hard and in so many different ways that it seems that they won't be able to evolve quickly enough. So the way we're headed now, we're going to lose a lot of species, which is regrettable in many different ways. Um, yeah. Now the question is what will happen? There have been what have been called mass extinctions in the past. There are five great mass extinctions where a large proportion of the world of the Earth's life has gone extinct. The most recent one was when the asteroids slammed into Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs and many other things 66 million years ago. There are many people who say what is happening now is a sixth mass extinction. And I think that yeah. more or less they're correct if, if we continue going in the way we're going. But after each of the previous mass extinctions, life has recovered. Eventually there are more species on earth than before the mass extinction. So probably unless we completely render the planet uninhabitable, life will eventually recover. Mm -hmm. However, before you say, oh, well, well, then we don't need to worry about it, that recovery has taken five to 10 million years. Yeah. So that's a lot of generations of our descendants who uh, will be deprived of the, all the benefits, both real or tangible and philosophical of, of life's diversity. But eventually life probably will recover. Uh, so in, in some sense, that, that's one response. Um, I've forgotten my second response. My second point, uh, can species adapt to the changing climate we're, we're gonna, and things? We're looking at that. Ah, yes. The second thing is how evolution will proceed in the future. Well, there's a, also another um, a major factor, and that is humans increasingly will be capable to directly cause evolution by genetic engineering. And... Uh, we're developing that technology now, what are called GMOs and so on. And with new CRISPR technology, we can actually, instead of requiring natural selection to operate on naturally occurring variation, we can create that variation itself. And it's still early days, but it seems very likely that to some extent, the future of evolution will be humans directly causing that evolution through our genetic manipulations. And what that will do remains to be seen. It's many people are afraid of it. And I think for very good reasons, because we don't have a, a good track record of dealing with new technology in responsible ways. And, right. um, and particularly, of course, the question, will we apply this to ourselves or not? Um, mm -hmm. That remains to be seen, but certainly it is a new type of evolution or a new way evolution will occur that has not occurred in the history of the planet. And it, I think it's unpredictable where that will lead us. It, there's plenty of science fiction about that, but no real science yet. But speaking of science fiction, that leads to the third question. What about life on other planets? Um, I agree with many people that it just seems highly likely that there are other places in the universe where life has originated. That we used to think that the planet Earth was unique 
that there were no other planets anywhere else in the universe like Earth. And so maybe life is unique because we just happen to be on this one planet that's just right for life to evolve. Well, now we know that idea is completely wrong, that there are millions, hundreds of millions, who knows, billions of planets roughly similar to, to life, uh, to Earth, where life in theory could originate. And by roughly similar, I mean the right temperature and the right variation in temperature and the right chemicals and an atmosphere. Uh, there are huge numbers of planets that have conditions in which life one could conceive of as originating, life similar in some ways to what we have on this planet. And just the odds then that this would be the only planet of those hundreds of millions on which life originated just seems very unlikely. And so it is very likely that somewhere else in the universe, maybe many places, life has arisen. And then the question is, what does that life look like? How similar is it to what we see here on planet Earth? Are there humanoids? Well, here we can look at science fiction and the answer is pretty clear. Oh yes, we're gonna see life that's almost identical to what's on Earth. I mean, look at the movie uh, Avatar. You know, they had all these plants and animals and they were all based on Earth things, except maybe you gave the horses an extra pair of legs or you know, changed this or that. But very clearly Avatar said, evolution on Pandora will look very similar to life on Earth. Or look at Star Trek. Oh, we could get in all the details, but most science fiction movies well, the intelligent life forms walk around on two legs. They have something like a head. And, they, you know, they're, right. they're humans that you've tweaked by only three fingers or something like that. Uh, <laughs> right. So that's what science fiction says. Not all science fiction. One of my favorite ones was the movie Arrival a few years yeah, ago. It's a great movie. Great a movie. great movie. And the extraterrestrials, the aliens were completely different from us and incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's the question of, this is a question of convergent evolution. Will we convergently see life being similar on other planets? And there are some people who say that there will be, that they look at all the convergence on Earth and say, well, it's going to be the same thing on other planets. So there are, there are best ways to evolve and that evolution will occur in the same way and that life on other planets will be recognizable. So much so that some people, very credible scientists say they expect something more or less similar to humans to have evolved. I personally find that unlikely, that mm -hmm. planets are going to be so different in so many ways that you know, life based on who knows what uh, will be very different, that I would expect that life on other planets would be very different than what we see here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But we'll see. Uh, I guess <laughs> we'll have to find out someday. <laughs> yes. I, I, it's interesting. My intuitions kind of track the same way. I, I definitely think it's unlikely that we're the only planet out of the billions that have uh, living organisms. And I also agree that if, if we do find living organisms or life on, on, uh, on other planets, I don't think we'll find, you know, uh, green men or humanoid features, uh, maybe, but I think it's more of different types of, uh, uh, you know, unicellular or types of multicellular organisms. So I, I agree with you. It tracks. Uh, the book is called Improbable Destinies, Fate, Chance, and the Future of Evolution. It's in paperback. It's been out for uh, a couple years now. It's fantastic. One of the best books I've read on convergent evolution. Um, so uh, everyone should check it out. Uh, Jonathan, where can people get the book and where can they find you and all of your work? Well, um, they can get the book, you know, online through any bookstore. I mean, it's published by Penguin Random House or Riverhead Press, part of Penguin Random House. But just Google Improbable Destinies, you'll find a way to, to get the book. Um, or it's in, it's in bookstores. Uh, I am a professor at Washington University. If you just Google me, I have a web page and um, you can find some of the things I've done. Yeah, no, that, that's 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 great, uh, Jonathan. This was such a fantastic conversation. Uh, I, I really loved every minute of it. It's uh, it's really nice to to get all of your brilliance here and uh, all of your hard work and research. And so I, I just can't say enough thanks to you for, for coming on and uh, and talking with me. Well, I really appreciate the invitation. It's been a lot of fun. Alrighty, thank you.